My dearly beloved in Christ, we rejoice today to celebrate a feast day in honor of the Holy Family, reminding ourselves that the family was instituted by God himself as the ideal situation in which children are reared and grow up and learn good habits, develop virtues, and have their character formed and are prepared for adulthood. Our divine Lord wished to show the importance of the family by himself sanctifying family life. Imagine the bliss, the beauty of that life in the holy home of Nazareth. Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph, the Holy Family, where St. Joseph humbly, quietly went about his daily duty, supporting the family, protecting the family, being always interested in the needs and the welfare, the well-being of the family. Our Blessed Mother keeping the home, living a life of union with Almighty God, and shedding around her her virtues. Our Divine Lord, God himself, humbly submitting to our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. And is that not a shocking, a marvelous statement in Scripture that he was subject to them, to two of his own creatures? And notice the next words of the Gospel, but Mary kept all these words carefully in her heart. She contemplated our Lord and meditated upon his life and his example. So the members of our families all have a model in the Holy Family. Fathers can look to St. Joseph as an example to take to heart their responsibility to lead the family to God, to protect the family, to provide for the family, and to be the head of the home. Notice that when it came to the flight into Egypt, the angel did not come to our Blessed Mother and tell her to take the child and tell St. Joseph and flee into Egypt. But the angel spoke to Joseph and said, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt because Joseph was the head. It was his responsibility to make these difficult decisions and to lead the family. Mothers, on the other hand, have none other but our Blessed Mother as their model. And the mother is the heart of the home. It is the mother that will have the most lasting influence and the formation of the children, teaching them virtue, teaching, giving them good example, instructing them in what is right and what is wrong, and giving them those important lessons that will be with them for the rest of their lives. And of course, children, and really all of us, because we're all subject to some authority. We all have that example of our divine Lord himself, who wished to grow up in the Holy Family, giving us an example of obedience. He was subject to them. What a wonderful thing. And how our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph must have been in awe and humbled by this wonderful example of the Christ child, going about doing the bidding of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, happy to do everything he was told. What a wonderful model, what a wonderful example. So families, we encourage you today to consecrate your family to the Holy Family. We've printed a prayer on the back of the bulletin for you to use as an act of consecration and to look to the members of the Holy Family as your models, your example, your guide. We also find other words in today's gospel that are puzzling. It says that after our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph found the boy Jesus in the temple, and she said to him, why have you done so to us? And he gave them an example that the things of God must always come first. But then he went down with them to Nazareth and was subject to them. But then it says... 
and Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. So how are we to understand these words? Because Jesus was divine. How could he advance in wisdom or in grace? In age, yes. Our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, the villagers of Nazareth, observed him growing, going through the various stages of boyhood and young manhood into adulthood. But how could he grow in wisdom and in grace? So theologians give various uh, explanations for this. A couple of them I would like to read. And first of all, regarding knowledge. It is important to understand that the human soul of Christ had three kinds of knowledge. First, beatific, by which he saw God and all things in God, and so was rendered blessed. Second, knowledge that was infused by God. And third, experimental knowledge acquired by daily use. Now, our Lord had those first two kinds of knowledge because his human nature was united to the divinity. And so he could not grow. But he was able to grow and did in what we call experimental knowledge. So there's one way of knowing something subjectively, and there's another way of knowing it by doing it, by experiencing it. And when we hear the parables of our Lord, such as speaking about a sower going out to sow in the field, we can think to ourselves that our Lord must have helped the farmers of Nazareth participated in bringing in the harvest. And so he had experience, experimental knowledge. He experienced certain things as man in his human nature. So that's one sense of understanding how our Lord could have advanced in the area of knowledge. But wisdom and grace, he had from the moment of his conception, he was united to the divinity and therefore could not really grow in wisdom and grace in that sense. But here's what St. John Damascene says. He says, Christ progressing in wisdom and grace, not in himself, but in his members, that is, in Christians. For he went on producing greater acts of virtue day by day, that he might teach us to do the same. All our life is without ceasing, either a progress or a decline. When it is not becoming better, it is becoming worse. Therefore, in order not to lose ground, we must make progress, as St. Bernard teaches at length, where among other things he says, the just man never thinks that he has laid hold of justice, never says it is enough, but rather always hungers and thirsts for justice, so that if he were to live forever, he would always make every effort to be more just, would always strive with all his power to progress from good to better. For he has not enlisted for a year or for a time like a mercenary, but rather has entered the service of God's household for eternity. So that's a, a good explanation uh, by spiritual writers on how we can understand these words. But once again, as our Lord advanced, and here's another, uh, another explanation given by theologians, that he manifested more and more virtue and his wisdom to others and became more and more pleasing to them as they observed him. So we also ought to always seek to grow in grace and in God's, in virtue, in God's grace. Let us then today reflect upon this wonderful example that our Lord, who could have come into the world at the age of a full-grown manhood, nevertheless chose to be born and to progress through the different stages of childhood and of boyhood and adulthood in order to give us an example to serve God at every moment of our lives and always to strive to grow spiritually. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.